Welcome to uh, the worship service this morning. Uh, I invite you to stand for the opening song. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Your name is life Every stronghold shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety. Every soul held captive by depression, I speak Jesus. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows. Burn like fire Shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness Over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within His presence.
we speak the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our service here this morning. Um, I am so glad to see each one of you here this morning and those that might be joining us online. So welcome. We hope that you are blessed and encouraged by our time together here this morning. And we are excited to have Brian, Bishop Brian Martin here with us this morning. And he's going to be bringing our message with us in a bit. So, yeah, we're looking forward to that. Um, so, looking ahead, uh, jump into church life. Uh, a couple of announcements. We have your bulletin this morning. I guess that is a peach color. I don't know. A little peachy. A uh, couple of announcements I would like to highlight. Um, first one, City Gate. There are several sign-up sheets on the bulletin board in the back there um, for helping with the Sunday snack or uh, sack lunches at CityGate. So please sign up for the date that you're interested either by providing food or if you want to volunteer with that. Um, number two, uh, the women's retreat, which is planned for October 11th through the 13th. Um, you can sign up on the bolt board in the hallway. Uh, your deposit is due today. So don't forget that. Deposit is due today to Brenda Burkhorter. Um, also, I noticed there is a, looks like there's an NDS opportunity um, in the bulletin. Uh, read over to that. It looks like they're seeking for one or two hosts uh, host families for two volunteers that are serving in MDS. So there's an uh, opportunity for you if you have that capability of hosting somebody. Also, Woodcrest Retreat Weekend. Uh, a couple things on that. It is coming up here in July 26th through the 28th. This morning you'll find information in your mailbox. Um, if you're camping or coming as a day guest, um, there's information in there for you. Uh, there's also a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board for any day guests to plan, that are planning to come for Saturday, and that is for the morning breakfast. Um, campers, that people that are camping that weekend do not need to sign up. It's just that if you want to come for that breakfast, uh, you need to sign up. Uh, another part of that, the Saturday evening activity which is called Silly Olympics. Um, I'm not sure what it all consists of. is a bunch of silly activities. I think like a donut eating contest, uh, maybe a three-legged race, um, an egg toss. So everybody's welcome to participate. And there's a sign-up sheet on the, bill, bill, the bulletin board as in the hallway, yes. Or if you don't want to be part of it, you're welcome to come. That's always fun time as well to watch other people uh, make them look interesting. So yeah, looking forward to a good weekend at Woodcrest and a lot of information there. Um, at this time, we'll have the offering. I'm going to ask Janelle Horst to bring the offering front. Um, if you forgot, the basket will be up here on the stage. Um, there is a offering app that you can use as well. That's fine. Yep. And she agreed to pray for the offering for us. So God, we have confessed that your name is power. And I also confess that we don't know the fullness of that. We generally don't walk in the fullness of that and understanding that God. So we ask for you to do that in us. Open our eyes, open our ears, open our heart, help us see, help us know. Help us know you, your power, and understand that that power now lives within us. And so we are asked to walk in that and be your hands and feet and your voice to those around us. So we ask you to do that in us. And we ask that you use this offering to bring about that, your power here on earth, um, through, through facilitating people and uh, things that, that bring you, that show you to others. And we thank you that because we ask, God, you hear us. And we trust your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Janelle. Um, as we come to a call of worship, um, I was thinking about what to share, and I was reminded about Wednesday, uh, we had a prayer night, and I was blessed by the time we had during our prayer meeting this past time. Um, we spent time dwelling in the word together, sharing with one another, and just um, praying with one another and lifting things up. It's, it's just a great time. I encourage everybody to come out Wednesday night if you have the opportunity. It's, um, it's a blessing time. And I was blessed this past Wednesday. And uh, we read from Psalms 84. So I just want to reflect and read that again uh, for this time. Psalms 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My soul earns and even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near, her, near your altar. O Lord Almighty, my King, my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house, for they are ever praising you. Blessed are those strength is in you. You have set our hearts on a pilgrimage as they pass through the valley of Baca. They make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, O Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Look upon our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does not he withhold. From those who walk, it is blameless. O oh Lord Almighty, blessed is a man who trusts in you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you for this day you have given us, um, this time that we can come into your house and dwell in your presence. And how sweet that is. What a blessing that is just to dwell in your presence. Dear Lord, it's not just a place anymore. Your presence dwells within us. And what a blessing that is. What a privilege that is. So as we move about and go into this world, that we may shine and show that presence that lives within us. And Lord, uh, we just want to honor and praise you for that. Um, Lord, I just thank you for your word, the word that we can look into, and the things and the truths that you tell us, that we can share those with others. Lord, I just pray for those who may be going through a hard time right now, um, a sickness, an illness, or just recovering from surgery. Uh, Lord, just... Uh, Place your hand on them. Just give them a peace and the comfort that they need right now uh, in those moments. Um, and we need your strength. We look to you for our strength, and I thank you for that. Lord, I just pray for those that are in missions, um, those that might be leaving and going to a place that is hard, that doesn't know your word, or there's a lot of evil in the midst of that. And I think of those individuals right now. Lord, you have blessed them for a special purpose. So go with them and be with them that they may carry your word and into the world that they may share that. And be led by the Spirit. Lord, I just invite you here this morning in our presence here as uh, Brian brings the message this morning, uh, what he has to share with us. And uh, give him your words and help us to hear what he has to say and that we listen. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. I invite you to stand and join us in worship this morning. Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 to 22. The rich in the kingdom of God. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing, <coughs> one thing you lack, he said. <coughs> Go sell everything you have and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. <clears throat> At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth.
Gospel of John, chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. Healing at the pool. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? without hope, no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart is given my morning required my feet rose to dance When death was arrested, my life began Though your grace so free washes over me You have made me new, now life begins with you John 8, 1 through 12. 
At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing them. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. spoke a word you're singing over me you have been so so good to me for I took the bread you breathed your life in me you have been so so kind Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, Shadow, you won't light up the mountain, you won't climb up, coming out. 
said and the careful reading of the word. Thank you both for reading the scriptures that we'll be looking at here today. Before we go to the word, I just want to give you a couple brief updates. Uh, first off, my wife Shirley was unable to join me today. Um, we have some babysitting duties and also she had some responsibilities at our home church at Weaverland and uh, she's not with me today. But just some, uh, some, wearing my bishop hat here for just a few moments, uh, regarding some things that are happening in our district and also in our conference. Uh, many, many good things that are happening, and I, I just want to pass this word along to you. Uh, back in late May, we had our spring assembly held at Mellinger's Mennonite Church over near Lancaster, and it was a packed house, and uh, just a really rich day, and, and a live church effort of leadership was well represented there that day, as well as our district. And uh, just a really good day. Um, there's a number of seeking congregations from across the United States that were with us, and um, um, that continues to be an ongoing reality. Just this past Friday, we had Bishop Board, um, and there were seven new churches, mostly from Virginia, that uh, joined LMC, and there's about um, another whole conference that is uh, in discernment here in July from the South Central Conference that is making this discernment about uh, joining LMC. So... That continues to be a, a journey, and uh, navigating and holding all that responsibly and stewarding that well, as well as giving um, care to these congregations, uh, as well as our own district, continues to be a, just a, a reality to manage. And I just want to acknowledge that in light of my own uh, responsibilities and sharing our district with, uh, with Jim Wyke and also with Eric Marshall. One of those, uh, this morning, uh, across LMC, we are meeting in, uh, there's about 300 congregations that are meeting and speaking about um, 12 different languages in 16 different states and five nations. So that's a pretty good reality of uh, the demographic of who LMC is here today. And one of those churches is Cuba. We have uh, nine churches in Cuba, and I would just uh, reference the note that's in your, in your bulletin this morning as well, just a brief update. But Samuel Lopez, who is the bishop, gives oversight to about 40 churches that are all Spanish-speaking, and um, one of those, uh, nine of those would be in Cuba, and some in Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Mexico, and Honduras, uh, in the Dominican Republic. And um, anyhow, as I shared with you back in, in February, uh, you responded and, and responded with some, some aid and uh, some support. And I just want to share a couple of pictures with you uh, I went there in, in February, um, 
and uh, joined Samuel uh, in, in Cuba. And uh, one thing you'll notice about Cuba it is it's socialist. It's, um, and since, the 19, since 1959, it's been under a U.S. embargo. So all the cars there in Cuba, not all of them, but most of them are from the 1940s and 50s. Uh, there's very few modern uh, conveniences. And so this is just a, a simple picture of, of the reality of those old cars that I it felt like you were stepping back in time. We went there on a religious visa, which is, uh, takes about three months to get. But uh, surprisingly, with a religious visa, there is a lot of freedom. We uh, just had to declare where we're going, where we're going to be staying, where we're going to be visiting, and where we're preaching. Um, but there was eyes and ears on us at all times, but lots of freedom, and no way felt threatened at any point in time. But along with a live church effort, um, there was, um, I had gathered a number of gifts and humanitarian aid to take with me. I took about $6,000 in cash. A chunk of that was right here from Alive, so thank you. Um, took that all in $50 bills to Cuba. And also t- filled up uh, nine suitcases. Three of those were from Alive, and uh, the other six were from, from Weaverland. And uh, I had no idea this, this number nine had been planted on my heart. I didn't realize there was nine churches in Cuba, uh, LMC churches. But as I gathered all this, all this stuff, these toothbrushes and toothpaste and toilet paper, started packing suitcases as full as I can get them, I filled nine. I just thought that was just so good of God, um, that there'd be one dedicated suitcase per congregation. And uh, so anyhow, uh, the top picture there on the left is me at two o'clock in the morning in a Philadelphia airport, dragging nine suitcases, we had 14 all together with the six of us, but dragging these, uh, these nine suitcases through the line at two o'clock in the city of brotherly love was quite an experience. Um, but I, I, there was a moment in my, in my spirit I thought there's no way these nine suitcases, these 14 all together, are going to come out the other end. I, I just, there was a, doubt, a bit of doubt in me. But about four hours later, we arrived in Havana at the airport, and lo and behold, 14 suitcases come off the, off, off the plane. And so just again, a gift of God's provision. Um, we're standing there on the bottom photo with all the, uh, all the leaders um, with... with uh, the materials that we distributed among the churches. But you'll notice there in the picture on the right, uh, it's one of the pastors down there. Samuel Lopez, he gets down a couple times a year, and he said one thing he really noticed is how malnourished these pastors are. Even from a year ago to this year, you can see this, this pastor is as thin, thin as a, a, thin as a bean pole. I apologize for my mic, it just keeps pulling away from me. Um, but he's just as thin as, thin as a be- bean pole, and... Um, the reality is, from a, from a year ago, we, we met at a Catholic convent, and uh, for, for $10 a day, we got three good meals and room and board. And uh, the meals included meat and milk and coffee. And I didn't realize this at the time, but for most of the, almost all the leaders there, since February a year ago, they had not seen any mil- meat, milk, toothpaste, toilet paper, uh, or toothbrush. And um, so when we distributed these gifts that you had given us, um, was just an incredibly precious, precious gift to them. And so I just say thank you uh, to them. Um, and so just a, a picture of socialism. I just want to give you three pictures of socialism in one slide. Um, this is not a political statement. It's just a statement. You can take it or leave it. But socialism is evil. It just is. It just robs humanity of all their dignity, their self-worth, their value, their productivity that God has put in us that you see way back in the garden where God said to go and take care and steward the garden and take care of it. It's all for you, but take care of it. But socialism just guts that totally from humanity. And it leaves nothing but a hollow, shallow uh, uh, a bit of a person. And so this top picture on the left is just a, demonst- just a case in point of socialism broken streets, and nobody on the streets. Everybody's behind closed doors or walled, walled compounds because that's the way it is. Uh, you don't trust your neighbor. And um, also the, the bottom picture on the left is, ten, is on a six-lane highway at 10 o'clock in the morning on a Monday. Don't try that on 222 tomorrow morning at, two, at 10 o'clock. As far as I could see, I walked out in the middle of the highway. As far as I could see from one way to the other, not a single car in sight. Why? because he can't afford to drive. Making 5 to $6 a month, gas costs are around $6 a month if they have gas, 
most of the time they're out. But if they have gas, it would cost you one month wage for one gallon of gas to drive a car that maybe gets about 12 to 14 miles to a gallon. You do the math, it just does not compute. So could go, could say a lot more um, there, but uh, as one pastor said, one of them pastor said, in Cuba, without Christ, hope is dead. And I think of the scriptures that were read and the prayers that were said already this morning of who we have and our identity in Christ, that without that, no matter all of our provision, hope can also be dead even in our own nation. And so the top picture on the right there, I was, we were visiting a pastor in her home, and um, on a refrigerator, just like our refrigerators, there's stuff hanging, right, on magnets. And I saw this, this drawing on the, on the refrigerator, and so I just decided curiosity. I said, so tell me about this picture. And it was drawn by the pastor's granddaughter. And um, they said then, let me explain this picture to you. So you see, if you can't really see too well, but it's a butterfly in a tree. And the tree is saying to the butterfly, butterfly, why are you so sad? And the butterfly says in response, because I have no color. And I was just struck by that because this young child, about seven, eight years old, had no crayons, had no color markers, had no color pencils, how to draw this picture with a lead pencil. But there's a deeper spiritual application from that, of from the mouth of children comes wisdom, Jesus says, of where human dignity is robbed of all its color. And that's what you see is just plain black and white and just robbed of, of all the few thing, good things of life. But in the midst of all this darkness, there's a church. And here's what I want to leave you with. In the midst of that, um, the top picture there, or the bottom picture, we commission four missionaries, just like we're doing here, here stateside, but we're, they're sending missionaries. And so some of your money that you gave went to support these missionaries that were commissioned to go and plant more churches in Cuba. A beautiful, beautiful model. And then we attended two graduations. The top picture was 26 persons who graduated from a three-year program uh, through LMC, uh, much like STEP. But, uh, and then the, bottom, the middle picture is another church that graduated nine students uh, going through the same program. Just a beautiful, uh, beautiful image that God continues to grow and flourish a church no matter what, no matter where, and no matter what circumstances they're in. So I just leave you with this final shot here. Just a beautiful people um, that, is, uh, that, that are just there. Um, in your program, in your bulletin, it talked about MCC. I just got word that yesterday. Barnabas Aid, we, we make connections through Barnabas Aid to ship, have a portion, five skids of dehydrated food through Blessings of Hope to be shipped to uh, Cuba, and he earmarked it for LMC. I just got word yesterday that the container arrived in Havana. So praise be to God. Yes, I think that's worthy of a, of a clap offering. And there's another container on the water somewhere between here and Cuba uh, from MCC where a portion of that load is also earmarked for the LMC churches. A lot of the aid that's been going there uh, through MCC has not been reaching any of the LMC congregations. So I continue to have this on my heart that God is asking us to ship a dedicated container, 40 foot long container, strictly, purely for LMC churches there in, in Cuba. When that comes to be, I'll let you know. Um, it's incredibly complicated. Uh, I would just invite you into praying to that end. Uh, it is possible, but it takes, it takes some, um, some divine work that is far beyond my scope and my, my skill set. Well, this morning, three signs of a Jesus-centered authenticity. Three signs of Jesus-centered authenticity. Rarely do I use more than one text in a, in a message. This, sometimes I use two. Never do I use three. And so I'm really grateful to the worship team reading the text for me and doing so, so very beautifully and very carefully. But the three texts that were read by the worship team this, this morning, they, they reflect on three different encounters that Jesus had in with people, that Jesus had with people. And there can be many such encounters. You could say six signs or nine signs. There's many, many more than three signs. This morning, we're just going to focus on three signs that Jesus, pulling from the Gospels, from the three accounts of a Jesus-centered authenticity. What does it look like? And how does Jesus model this for us? And um, just as, as I've been paying attention to the messages that, that both Jeff and, and David and Kevin have been using, giving attention to Peter and to 
more recently to Philippians and, and David to, to, um, um, to, to Daniel and also the Gospel of John. So this morning, just centered back again, reflecting on what has been preached recently, but this whole idea of authenticity, what does that mean for you? What does it mean for a live church effort? Does it doesn't matter. I believe it does. And so in Mark chapter 10, it's page 716 in your pew Bible, but this Mark 10 story of this rich young ruler comes running up to Jesus and he kneels down and he asks this profound question, what good thing must I do that I may inherit eternal life? That's a fair question. It's a question that we should all perhaps ask, but he was looking at, uh, focus on the doing part of it, and Jesus responds, well, why do you call me good? There's only one good, and that's God. And Jesus goes on then to instruct him, you know the commandments? Do them. And, of course, the young man responds, all these I've kept since my youth. So we could probably conclude that this is a good guy. He checks all the boxes. He, he pays attention. But what Jesus pushes back on here gives us our first sign of a Jesus-centered authenticity, and it is this point number one. Sign number one, a Christ-centered authenticity always in love speaks truth even when it's hard, when it's hurt, or it's not received. Look here in verse 21. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Love. Jesus loved him. But then he speaks truth into his life. Look how directly Jesus speaks. Verse 22, one thing you lack. Jesus speaks very direct. He speaks truth into this young man's life. And my paraphrase to verse 21 would be that, my friend, you worship your stuff. You're worshiping your stuff. Get rid of all your stuff. In order to take up your cross, you can't be carrying all your stuff. So lay down your stuff, and then you can carry your cross, and then come and follow me. Is basically what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 10. The model here, I believe, is for us to practice in being an authentic people, authentic faith community, is to love and to speak truth. It's not an either or. Do, do, I, do I love or do I speak truth? It's not an either or. It's a both and. Jesus does both of these. He loves him and then he speaks very directly into his life. So Jesus speaks, he asks him, you know the law, you know the commands. And then Jesus, go, it's interesting that, that Jesus quotes commands, commandments number five through number 10. Of the 10 commandments, Jesus quotes or references commandment number five through 10. And the man quickly responds, check, all these I've kept since my youth. Been there, done that, I, I'm good there. However, the commandment that stood in the way of this young man and Jesus was commandment number one. You shall have no other gods before me. Jesus speaks truth, and he calls him on it. In verse 21 here, perhaps one of the saddest verses in scriptures, at this truth the man's face fell and he walked away, and Jesus left him walk. There's a lesson there for us. Jesus isn't running down the road after him, trying to get in his way, yelling at him. He just lets him walk. That's part of what sometimes love does. Love lets people walk. That's tough love. And if there's ever an instant or example of how we are created with free will, this, my friends, is a, is a case in point. The decision was the man's. Jesus didn't run after him, didn't, didn't get in his way. Jesus left him make his decision. He had to own his decision. There is no example in the Gospels, at least the Gospels that I read, where Jesus is chasing after somebody uh, in their decision. In love, he spoke the truth, and he left that decision to the, with, with them. There's no bullhorn. He's not yelling and screaming at them. He just lets them walk. And this then leads to sign number two, which occurs here at this place, this text that was read to us by Harlan. The poor Bethesda. I give you this picture here just because I think it brings validity to that this is not some imaginary place. Does it exist or doesn't it exist? Shirley and I stood here a couple years ago when we were in Israel 
and stood there in the pool of Bethesda. A real place. A reason I say it is it's real people, real place, and real dirt. Sometimes we need to be reminded of that. But here in, in verse 5, here in, in, in John, John's text, the second story, here in the Temple Mount, a man who was paralyzed for 38 years, or he had this infirmity, or he was crippled. And in verse 6, it says that Jesus saw him from among many, that this whole area was lined with people crippled and blind. And because once in a while, the spirit would stir the water, and the first one down in the pool would be healed. And so this, these people hung out here, and also a place where people came to for their annual worship, and so they could connect some, collect some benevolent gifts from their people as well. But Jesus sees this man among many uh, lying there. And Jesus sees this guy, and Scripture says, Jesus, knowing that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked them this question. Do you want to get well? Do you want to be well? Friends, that that may seem like a simple answer to you and I. It may seem like, uh, like, of course I want to get well. Of course I want to be well. But this man, let's be real here, this man had a rhythm, 38 years. He had a rhythm, he had a system, and he had his own comforts, right? Even in the midst of his infirmity, he had his patterns that were normal to him. And now Jesus is asking him, do you want change? And and what happens is change means change, right? Right? It's going to mean change for this. All his rhythms and all his patterns that he would have known are going to get turned on their head. But Jesus, none the, none the least, asked him this question. And so that leads then to this second sign. Sign number two. Jesus-centered authenticity in love asks hard questions and listens for ownership. The point is here, friends, that Jesus makes no assumptions. He doesn't just see this guy and says, be well, or I want to heal you. He asks the man, do you want to be well? Just because this guy's laying here does not translate that he wants to be well. Again, a case in point for free will, it doesn't get any more clear than this. The guy could have said, no, I'm quite comfortable, thank you very much. I have my norms and my rhythms, like I said earlier, Don't mess with it. But Jesus asks a hard question in love, and he's listening for ownership. He wants ownership. And the example that Jesus gives here is one that I've used in my ministry ever since I was was called into ministry back in 97. Is when I'm sitting with with anybody, whether it's a person in dysfunction, of, of, of relational brokenness, a person wanting some sort of healing or or direction in her life, I always, always have asked this question right out of the gate before we go any further. Do you want to be well? I want an answer to that question. Not that we can't go forward if they say, no, I don't want to be well, but I'd sooner know that up front than later, right? I value your time, I value my time, and if you don't want to get well, I'd just as soon... I'd just soon know that sooner than later because it's going to project then how we're going to work at this, right? So Jesus asked this question of this man. Do you want to be well? Hard questions looking for ownership. Friends, that's a sign of Jesus-centered authenticity. As is true in the physical, here, a crippled man, physically broken, crippled, what's true in the physical is equally as true in the spiritual. Those two are so much alignment. The fact is that some people want to remain in their crippled state. I'm speaking spiritually crippled. They want to stay in spiritual bondage, or they want to stay dragging a ball in a chain, or whatever that may be. They're just as comfortable staying in that position as opposed to getting well. That's why this question has to be asked by an authentic church. Do you want to be well? And it's a question that we need in an authentic church, authentic faith community, is to be looking for an answer, looking for ownership.
The same was said of that rich young ruler. He didn't want to be well, frankly. He wanted to stay in his condition. And that's why what is true in the physical is so true in the spiritual as well. And so as we do life, there's messy people, right? We stand with one another in a community, and we ask this question, do you want to get well? And as we ask this question, then that leads to sign number three. Sign number three, a Jesus-centered authenticity in love stays present in the mess and without condemnation or apology expects change. John chapter 8, beautifully read for us. I appreciate the emotion. It is a tender, tender passage of John chapter 8. This woman brought to Jesus. This is this unique encounter that Jesus had with this woman caught in adultery, the very act of adultery. This story is very unique in the Gospels in that Neither Jesus nor this woman were seeking each other. It was forced, they both were forced into this conversation by an an ulterior motive, an ulterior agenda of the Pharisees that were trying to trap Jesus. They had an agenda. And so both this woman is brought to Jesus, you could say against her will, and Jesus is, is there just because he's there teaching. And this whole scenario is forced upon him. And the fact be, being told here that this religious community, they could not care less about this woman. Stone her, and that's what the law said. They, they didn't give a rip about this woman, her wellness or her restoration with God. And so you have this incredibly messy and awkward moment there on the Temple Mount. And so here in verse 7, Jesus, kneeling down, begins writing in the dirt. There's this powerful moment where Jesus what he says to the crowd. And he gets up from after he's writing in the dirt, he says, you who are without sin, pick up the first stone and stone this woman. That's the law. She could be stoned. And he kneels again and he continues writing in the dirt and one by one, her accusers leave. From the oldest to the youngest, scripture says, one by one, they began just to simply leave for her. And there's lots of speculation of what did Jesus write? I'm not going to speculate because we don't know. But whatever it was that he wrote, or whatever the mood or the ambiance of that moment, there was conviction brought to her accusers. And one by one, they left. They walked away from the one they were accusing. The irony in this this whole John 8 text is, of all the people who ever lived, there's only one person who could have legally stoned this woman, and it was Jesus. Jesus could have stoned this woman and been righteous for it. The only one without sin. He alone was the only one. But Jesus in love, he stays present in the mess. He stays present in the mess. In her brokenness. And he now asks this, he speaks to this woman for the first time here in verse 11. And he asks her two questions. Verse 11, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she answers with a three-word question. No one, Lord. Then Jesus responds with these incredible words. Neither do I condemn you. Now, church, if it stopped right there, it would be powerful enough. But Jesus adds his other words yet that also define a sign of an authentic community. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Jesus, the point is, Jesus expects change. Not stuckness, not excuses, not it's not my fault. He expects change. He also, he does not look for a license to to sin. And so these three encounters, they model authenticity for a faith community. And as Jesus has modeled, I've also learned this this one valued point in ministry, and that's point number two, that authenticity requires a tender heart and thick skin, and sometimes that order has to be reversed. A quote by Vance Havner says that, a preacher should have the mind of a scholar, the heart of a child, and the hide of a rhinoceros. And the problem sometimes is, is how to toughen his hide without hardening his heart. I would say that, that quote is just not true for, for pastors. That's true for anybody that walks with Jesus and walks with people. 
that we do need to have a tender heart, a sharp mind, and also a thick skin. The point to this point here, I offer you eight references, two from each gospel, where I submit to you where Jesus reverses this tender heart and tough, uh, thick skin, where he got tough. He got tough with people at times, and he said things that needed to be said in love. Jesus models this so good for us, where he's, Jesus in love speaks directly and very pointedly to matters of the heart. And to speak to matters of the heart, it requires thick skin and a tender heart. Again, it's not an either or. Do I have thick skin or do I have a tender heart? Today I'm going to go through life with a tender heart. No, it's a both and. You do life with a both thick skin and a tender heart. And sometimes a tender heart leads and sometimes a tough, the thick skin leads. But they're always together. They're always together, church. And so Jesus gives us model for the church. I am reminded of this was modeled by Jesus so well. So This point was modeled by Jesus so well through his whole life. Even from the cross, even as he hung from the cross where he remains authentic. He remains true to himself and the calling of God. He's crying out to the Father, where are you? Why have you left me? Meanwhile, he's also talking to the thief next to him. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. And he looks to the people at the foot of the cross and says, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. That's authenticity. That's that thick skin and a tender heart. And he endured to the end until he said, it is finished. That's how Jesus modeled this idea of a tender heart and thick skin. And sometimes that order being reversed for us. So there's a model there for the church to be an authentic community, a tender heart and thick skin. And per the need of a situation, we need to discern which order is this today or what order do I need to apply this in this situation? And so I close with this point, point number three. That spiritual authenticity is a door that must swing both ways. This is why Jesus, with authenticity, he tested the authenticity of those that he was engaged with. He did this all the time. It's a door that must swing both ways. It's not a one-way door. There has to be authenticity from the, the recipient as well. This is why we never see Jesus chasing after somebody. If they're not authentic, and they're not real about making change, they're not real about giving ownership, Jesus says, let them walk. Let them walk. Jesus is ready to receive them, just like we see the father of the prodigal son. He's there waiting, but he's not chasing. He's waiting for them. In my own life, I sit on the both sides of, of the table, being asked hard questions in authenticity and accountability, and also asking hard questions of authenticity and accountability in the lives of others. So I'm both being asked, and I'm also the asker. That's how authenticity works. That's how accountability works in our own personal or private lives. It's a door that must swing both ways. And you ever want to see people get jammed up? It's when the door only swings one way. How many leaders and churches have fallen because the doors only swing in one way? Authenticity and accountability is expected of others, but, but not of themselves. Did you ever have a situation where because of the goodness of your heart, you don't test the swing of the door? Maybe your, your door swings, you're very authentic and very real and very vulnerable with others, but you never tested the door swing of the person that you're in, you're, perhaps you're engaged or in conversation with? I had a situation where Shirley and I were walking with, with two single moms. One had two children, one had four children. And they both faced really hard circumstances. And we were in a situation where it, we, it was both in our hearts to be able to walk with these moms and help them out. And over a period of time, we began to notice it, things were reciprocated. And there was, there was some authenticity uh, particularly from the one, and um, could have some really good conversations. But even in both of these cases, both faced a lot of challenges. We were walking, and we began giving time, we started giving resources and, and helping invest ourselves into them, and we really put ourselves out there. 
And then with this, but I never tested the door swing on both of them like I probably should have. Asking myself, does this door swing both ways? And after a while, I noticed that the door swing, the one was very approachable, very open to trusted relationship, and I found myself wanting to do even more for, for that individual. For the other one, I began to notice inconsistencies and excuses and, and untruth and a lack of authenticity and, and even accusations and a finger back in my face for some of the things that we were trying to do for her. And I realized then that I'm being played. And I needed to get to a place that Jesus models here for us in some of these texts. Enough. I'm done here. And we walk away or we let them walk away. Spiritual, the point is, friends, spiritual authenticity as modeled by Jesus must, is a door that must swing both ways. And I give you a reference of John chapter 3 and 4. Two beautiful examples of what authenticity looks like. Back-to-back examples of a religious leader, one who was in the upper, the upper crust of, of religious society. And he comes to Jesus at the, in the cover of darkness to avoid being detected or, or being discovered. And he has really hard questions about who Jesus is. And as this man swings his door of authenticity wide open, guess what? Jesus is right there, meets him right there. The door swings both ways. And it's from John chapter 3 where we have the most beautiful verse among one of the most beautiful verses in in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should never perish but have eternal life. It comes from that encounter with this religious man in a cover of darkness. Then you have John chapter 4. The very next chapter, you have Jesus in Samaria and the woman at the well. And the longest conversation recorded in the Gospels between Jesus and this woman. And again, you have this very authentic, it doesn't start out very authentic, But as you begin to engage conversation, you have a very authentic door is swinging both ways. And this woman who has five husbands and a guy that she shocked up with is is not her husband. And and they have this conversation and Jesus meets her right there. And they engage and model authenticity. And Jesus, here in that text, he reveals himself as the living water. And to the end of that conversation, she leaves her water pot, that's her identity, in all her mess, she leaves her water pot and goes back to Samaria, and he goes back to the townspeople and says, could this be the one? Could this be the one that our fathers were telling us about, the Messiah? And the whole town, many, many in that town, end up converting to Christ. Jesus-centered authenticity. It begins with me. It begins with you. It begins with a live church, Ephrata. As we engage with a Jesus-centered authenticity, there you will find a Jesus-centered faith every time. And as we engage with Christ-centered faith, there you will find Jesus-centered authenticity. May God find us faithful and authentic. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these examples from Scripture of how real you were And Lord, your tender heart, always you led, always by love. And Lord, yet you also led with truth, always. Father, in our world today of so much compromise, so much nicety, and such easy offense, Lord, help us as followers of Christ learn how to love, to love as you loved, to speak truth as you spoke truth, to be gentle and kind and full of truth. Thank you, Father, for loving your church and being a model for her. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. As we stand for closing song. I remember those melodies, the words we sang when I first believed. Songs of redemption, stories of hope, heaven waking inside my soul.
soul In Christ alone My solid ground Amazing grace So oh, how sweet the sound On that rugged cross Jesus paid it all Because he lives This is my song Peace like a river Love so divine Those words kept singing Through the darkest night Sweet hymns of freedom And thumbs of praise Remind my heart to trust His name When I sing in Christ alone My solid ground Amazing grace Oh, how sweet the sound On that rugged cross Jesus paid it all Because He lives This is my song This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. A blessed assurance, glory divine, oh hallelujah, Jesus is mine. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. The blessed assurance, glory divine. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus is mine. And I sing in Christ alone, my solid ground. Amazing grace, oh how sweet the sound On that rugged cross Jesus paid it all Because he lives, this is my song In Christ alone, my solid ground Amazing grace, oh how sweet the sound on that rugged cross, Jesus paid it all because he lives. This is my song. Because he lives. This is my song. Because he lives. This is my song. Thank you, Brian, for that message, that powerful message. Um, what a challenge. What an encouragement. Um, am I being authentic? Am I checking that box of being authentic? When I think of the word authentic, um, many, a quick story. Many of you know my son is in Montana, and my owner, the owner of the ranch has lots of cars. And I'm a car guy. And uh, in his collection... He has two cars that are considered a thousand, or a thousand point car. In order for a car to be a thousand points, it has to be 100% original. He has a car there that is a thousand points car, and I had the opportunity to see it. He has, the steering wheel has a slight clack, crack in it, but they let that go. He has a second car that just so missed the mark because the oil filter was missing one letter. One letter. So I think of authentic, 100% pure. And uh, that is what God is impressing on us. Are we being 100% authentic? And uh, what a challenge of these three things, in love, what God is calling us to be. Um, to speak the truth, um, to ask the hard questions, and then to stay present in the mess. That can be hard, 
but I have to let that door swing both ways. When I really think about this, a lot of times, a lot of us like to check the boxes. I checked that box and got it off the list. But am I truly checking the box of being authentic, throwing everything aside, throwing everything away, and being 100% pure what God wants me to be through the mess, through the hard stuff, and to be able to be willing to let the door go both ways with a tender heart and a thick skin. So God bless you, and go be authentic. You're dismissed.